everybody and welcome back to a special Biff Rugby League podcast, episode number 24. And this is going to be a Women's Rugby League World Cup and a Wheelchair Rugby League World Cup special where we're going to dive into mainly the Women's Rugby League World Cup after speaking to coaches and players at the launch on Friday in York, but also a little bit of information on what the Wheelchair World Cup will provide you, just not entertainment-wise, but also how the rules work and everything else as well. Um, but first of all, Robin, how are I just want to say thank you to Robin for letting me stay this weekend so I could get to the launch on Friday. I would ask how you are, but I know you're pretty good after watching the, the Tongan performance this afternoon. Yeah, you're more than welcome, mate. We had a great time and we went and watched the um, game at Headingley and then got got a bit bevy in the pub watching the England match. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, and then, then I went and saw the Tonga game today and they, they were amazing. Um, not the biggest crowd in Middlesbrough, but. Um, a really good stadium. I reckon we'll go there again at one time. But um, yeah, looking forward to this little bonus we've got for everyone, bigging up the, uh, the women's in the wheelchair games that um, I'm equally excited for starting. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to it. We may as well crack straight on. At the launch on Friday, uh, Claire Baldwin was absolutely fantastic with the presentation. Councillors of York listening to John Dutton. Um, all, the, all the women's captains were able to speak uh, in front of the, the crowd. The trophy was there. Everyone was just so into what was going on at the t- at the time, and I managed to sit down and speak to all the players and coaches from the weekend. So you'll hear some of those conversations this afternoon. We're going to start with Group B because we know England in Group A. We just want to make sure that they are the last team we hear from because we believe they can go and win this t- tournament if if everything clicks for them. Um, we'll start with the the French uh, Robin and. With language difficulties and, a, and a, a, a translator present, we're not going to hear from the French, but I'll read back what um, head coach Vincent uh, Ballou said and his thoughts on what he what he wants his side to do and what he wants from, from the French as a, as a nation and stuff leading into this group. And he said, you need to have ambition in, in this game and you need to have ambition in a group like ours. We want to represent the French jersey with pride and we want to represent the French Federation with pride. We want to do our best and to do our best in the pool of hell, we need to maximise on all our resources. Just before we mention the resources that he's got at his disposal, what do you think of his comments of naming this the group of hell for, for him when I don't think it's necessarily, he's not going to go away from this without a victory, is he, with his team? No, I mean, it's a tough group. Like you've got probably the two strongest countries in in one group, so to, they they they're going to have to pull off an upset if they want to get through to the next stages. But um, yeah, like you said, they, they'll expect to probably beat Cook Islands. I guess I guess from a coach's point of view, um, sort of setting the expectations of the players. Like if they do if they do lose in in one of the early rounds um, against one of the top teams, not to get too disheartened. You know, like. Also, it gives them that sort of like underdog mentality, and um, I, I guess it's kind of yeah, a good way to um, set expectations. So, I guess that's a little bit of um, mind games going into it from the coach. Yeah, definitely. And and like you said, he's mentioned his resources there at the end, and we know a few of them. I mean, um, Lorianne Bivell, she's a regular in the women's super league. She was a centre or a second row for Wigan. During her spell with them in uh, 2022, she's played in Australia and was named man, uh, player of the match Sorry, in France's defeat to England back in June. But there's also um, a player at York, and the name escapes me, and you'll probably remind me that, that it's going to be leading the, this French side from, from the yeah. front, isn't she? Yeah, she is. Um, a great player. Um, got the size is there. Like You look at her when she's playing, you think like she's just a, an out-and-out prop that was just going to smash away through the middle. But she's also got some really nice slick ball handling skills as well. So she's a great option um, for that sort of like, uh, for, like at first receiver. She sort of looks shaped so sort of like she's going to take a run and then passes it out the back and allows a spread wide. Um, but also, you know, when the ball just sort of like lands at her feet, um, out, you know, by chance or there's just that chance at an offload, you can guarantee that um, she'll take it and she'll nail it. So. Um, I was really impressed when she came over to York uh, this year, and um, I'm, I'm confident they'll be sort of setting up the whole attack around this one player. I guess the the only concern will be uh, how much game time she gets. There'll be a much stronger side with her, hot, her on the field. They'll maybe just kind of have to manage the um, substitutes to make sure that they cover when she's um, needing to take a break. 
Yeah, definitely. And like I said, the name escaped me, so I, I did a little quick French Women's Rugby League World Cup squad. Um, Elisa Akpa was the name that I was thinking of. And like I said, when I've seen her play for Wales, it's been absolutely destructive. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how she gets on. And also um, just the whole of the French team in general, having finished fourth back in 2013, they'll be praying they can get to a semi-final again by fin- by shocking one of the, one of the big two. Um, yeah. Next up, we're going to go to the Cook Islands, and I spoke to the co-captain, Kimi uh, Braley nati and this this was her thoughts on the group that they're in. Like Coach has told me before, um, we're in the death pool, so we're pretty much going in with against the top tier nations. First, we have the Dularoos, then we have the second tier nation, which is the Kiwi friends, and then along with that, we have ended up with France. So, um, look, we're just trying to come here, play out, play some good footy, um, connect as a as a unit and hopefully get away with a couple of wins, not just one, <laughs> a couple, and hopefully, um, you know, go back onto the semi-final stage. Yeah, Robin, um, Kimmy speaking there. What, what do you make of her thoughts on also mentioning the fact that they're, they're in a group of hell? Yeah, the death pool. <laughs> um, for, I mean, for them, it's more, it's more realistic, isn't it? They're, gonna, they're the weakest side in that group. And again, there's probably that they want the underdog badge because it just makes it that little bit easier. It takes the pressure off. Um, but I also sort of like picked up that they're, they're like here to enjoy it a little bit more. And um, it's a bit more of an experience. You know, these players are coming over to the other side of the world and, and they just they just want to soak it all in and not, not get too, um, you know, too down if they don't get the result. But like in, in a par- paradoxically, that can sometimes actually lead players to play better when when the shackles are off. There's less pressure. They're enjoying themselves and they're not so bogged down in, in the results. You never know. They might just pick up a win with that kind of an attitude, um, especially if it helps the team to sort of gel over this like shared um, camaraderie. So um, yeah, let, let's see how they go. You know, they are in a death pool, but. They've still got some good talent in that team. Yeah, and a couple of players to watch in, in the Cook Island squad. Uh, Mackenzie Wiki. if that name sounds familiar to you guys, it's because she is the daughter of the of um, the New Zealand men's great Ruben Wiki. Only 21 years old, Mackenzie is determined to forge her own name in the sport and has ambitions of playing in the NRLW. And obviously, this is a massive um, global stage in order for her to impress. Um, as well as that, there's Shante uh, Kiria Rati, who at the age of eight, who only just turned 18 towards the end of the NRLW season, hasn't got a lot of experience of, on her side, but when she's going to play alongside Braley, um Nati in the halves, she apparently is going to be an absolute world beater and will be a household name in the next three years. So really keep an eye on her and that partnership that they have in the halves could really be the difference for the Cook Islands. But this is going to be tough for them. Like, like we've already mentioned a few times, both Australia and New Zealand in the same group and this is what um, New Zealand captain Crystal Rotta had to say about her, their group that they're in but also how it feels to have Australia in the group with them. Yeah, I mean, would approach it as you'd approach any group and, you know, in saying that France, um, you know, we don't actually know what France have to offer because we haven't really seen anything of them. So that's a bit of the unknown as well, which can be a little bit scary when you sort of um, don't know what to expect. But yeah, I guess we do have the tough pool and it was a bit strange to have one and two in the same pool. But um, I mean, it's exciting and it's I think it's a good thing for us because, um, you know, obviously the Jolaroos are the pinnacle and they're the world champions at the moment. So getting to play against the best um, and a pool play game as it gets a good gauge of where you're at. Yeah, what did you make of, of Crystal there saying that it's a, it's a shock to have both the one and two nations in, in the same group and the way the draw was come out? Do you think the, the way the Rugby League World Cup draw was done has helped England's chances of getting further? Or do you think that the fact that they're going to have to play one of these two sides in the semi final is, is going to hurt them? Yeah, that's it. Like, if you want to win the competition, you're going to have to beat these sides at some point. Um, would you rather play them early on or would you rather save it till the end? I'm not sure. I mean, if you look at the men's competition, I think uh, we were talking about this on Friday night, that all the teams that drew the top team in their group in round one have sort of fared better because they had that chance to sort of see where they compare early on and, and where they need to make improvements. The teams that went up against easier opposition at the beginning 
struggled when it got to the later rounds of the group stages because they hadn't had that test yet. It was harder to work out where the tunes of their armor were. So it's um, it's an interesting. It's just kind of your mental attitude, I suppose. Um, personally, I, if I was if I was New Zealand or Australia, I'd be quite pleased with this group because it means that um, you know you are pretty much guaranteed to get through to that next stage, and you aren't going to have to play each other in, in those semi-finals. So. Um, yeah, interesting. I guess I—I I mean, Rich, it does help England being in, in in this order, but um, you know, it might come back to bite the organisers if that's what they were trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, if England get if England end up do lifting the trophy, they're going to have to beat both of these teams. But we will get into that a little bit later on. Um, just what to expect from the Kiwis? They are bringing a very experienced side to this World Cup and are heavily predicted to go all the way to the final. Yeah. NRLW stars such a such as um, Aneta Claudia. Uh, Nua Sala, Amber Paris Hall, and Brianna Clark, alongside the likes of Shanice Parker, they're, left, they're going to have threats all across the park. And their group game against Australia on November the tenth will be the, the probably the game of the tournament if they don't play each other in, in the final. Um, Ray McGregor, also the NRLW Dahlia medalist back in this year, has lit up the NRLW with the Sydney Roosters. Ten try assists to her name in a very small, short format tournament, and she's going to cause some absolute damage from heart back from half back as a, as a whole they'll really be looking to to seal a fourth world cup victory um but there's going to be a team that are going to try and stop them from winning that and and that's the Gillaroos. even though there's 13 debutants in that squad um earlier this week or i think last week now even andrew voss on the on the 4020 podcast said that of all the four australian teams in this country uh, right now competing in a world cup across the men's wheelchair, PDRL and the women's, he believes that the women uh, have, the, have the best chance of, of lifting the trophy. And when I mentioned that to uh, Gillaroo's captain, Sammy Bremner, this is what she had to say. Good on Vossi setting us up for that. <laughs> um, no, like I said, um, I think a lot of us will uh, think about that in different ways. Um, a really important part of our squad is the mix of experienced players with new players and things that experienced players can bring to the uh, 24 players is their ability to teach the younger players how to interpret things like that, things they are going to read within the next couple of weeks and how we use that to become a good team. And I can see that already starting to happen. Um, you can see that younger girls uh, in particular and us older girls, uh, we might read something and then we sort of bounce off each other how we're going to use that to make sure that we go out there and perform um, and to meet those expectations that people speak about. So, um, yeah, for us, it's it's great that people speak like that to us, but what matters is how we react to it and the reaction that we will be striving for is winning our games. Yeah, Voss has really dug them a hole there, hasn't he, Robin? And you can <laughs> see, I, I do wonder how some of these inexperienced players will, will react to that, but also... Sam, Sammy Bremner there really well sort of taking to us every single one of these girls in this squad is going to be phenomenal and, and step up to the, the plate yeah I, I like that was such a good question you know because it was so offbeat and, and different that I think we got really good insight into how this Australia team are approaching the World Cup I think um, obviously she started off and like thanked uh, Bossy for dropping <laughs> a minute but uh, and so it's um, sort of then she sort of had to profession she had to justify it and try and be as professional as possible and so she reverted back to actually sort of revealing the whole ethos of that Australia team and she spoke exactly about the, the fact that they've got David Simpson about the blend of experience and youth and sort of the leadership and managing the expectations and you sort of get to understand that they're kind of relying on these players that have um, been there and done that to guide the these kind of younger less experienced players that that uh, obviously are going to be more dynamic but potentially a little bit less um predictable or a little bit maybe a bit inconsistent like you know the, when the pressure gets gets to them um so that was really interesting and i think that that'll be that'll be interesting to see and and like you know it, it might leave um, australia open if if they have an injury if somebody gets sent off and all of a sudden the leaders on that team are gone are they going to be exposed because they're going to struggle to, to find someone to fill that role? 
Yeah, um, yeah, I get exactly what you're saying. Like you said, yeah. thirteen. We've already said thirteen debutants in a in a squad of twenty two as well. So a couple of bands or an injury yeah. or two, they're going to have to see what they can they can call yeah. up. Um, some names that people will recognise that if they watch the NRLW or have even just heard of the women's game: Ali Brigginshaw, Sam Bremner, Millie Boyle, Kezi Apps, uh, Keely Davis, Talia uh, Furmayona. They're just a handful of the names, but. The main, the main one for me is Taryn Aiken. It's, it's difficult to just pick one player, obviously, but uh, the 23-year-old is one of the emerging stars of the NRLW. Uh, Brisbane Broncos uh, standoff was nominated for the Dahlia medal this year in, in the women's competition, losing out to the, key, the Kiwi player we just mentioned as well. So they're going to look to defend the two titles that they've won at the pr- previous two World Cups, but we, we can just pray and hope that... Um, England or New Zealand or someone knock them off because as English anyone but the Aussies is fine as long as it's not <laughs> Australia so um, but no it was it, in fact Brad Donald was the one that brought my attention to the, the Cook Islands halfback so it, it does seem that even though people might not may not know her and uh, may not have seen her play the Australians have as like, like they always do have done their research on every single player in every single team in their group and probably in the other group as well to make sure that they're prepared for every single opp- every single team they're going to come up against. Yeah, yeah. Whereas we heard like the New Zealand um, captain talking about they the France are a little bit of an unknown. So does that tell you that they haven't got the same kind of um, preparation done? So that might be the upper hand to Australia right there. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how Australia react to playing France and Cook Islands compared to New Zealand. There's some former New Zealand players playing for the Cook Islands and also for, for Canada as well so it's interesting they've, they've brought, brought an experienced team but there's players that have stepped down and played for their um, heritage um, which is which is really really interesting to see the fact that that's happening in the women's game as well moving on to group A really quickly um, having wrapped up group B obviously it sort of speaks to itself other than England standing out there's so many different stories and so many different ways this group can go especially when you look at Canada and PNG and Brazil like a lot of these teams not very experienced Canada have lost to Ireland in the warm up PNG played the Knights on Thursday night Brazil have only played I think two or three international games as a whole but drew uh, ran France really close on Thursday night as well speaking to Brazil uh, captain um, Maria Graf she said that the thought of playing in front of a big crowd at Headingley at two o'clock in the afternoon for their first ever game in the World Cup is is a little bit frightening, but they're just so proud of the fact that they can be at this World Cup. Then, and they're not just representing Brazil; they represent the whole of South America as well. And what do you make of of this Brazilian sort of the way this? Because they're all self funding themselves, and I just think it's a phenomenal story. It reminds me much of the Greece and the Jamaica stories in the Men's World Cup. Yeah, they they they're sort of the um, they're flying the flag for everyone back home in in Brazil, and hopefully it'll get gets build up some interest. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. Until I heard that Brazil were in this um, World Cup, I had no idea that rugby league was being played over there. I think um, I, I don't know if there's any any rugby league in any of the other South American countries. So they they're representing an entire continent for us in this World Cup, and. Um, yeah, I, I hope that it goes well for them. I think they've got uh, like a similar attitude um, to the Cook Islands, where it's sort of like, let's see if we can pick, like pick up a, a lucky win. But like I said, they're not too focused on results, and it's it's more about this putting putting rugby league out there and giving it everything, and, and hopefully trying to um, you know earn earn the respect of neutrals and people that think about getting involved in Brazil, which I'm sure they I'm absolutely sure they will be. And, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to see it. A bit, bit of an unknown, and yeah, it'll be cool. We'll have to see if any of those players end up staying over here and get picked up to play in the Super League. Yeah, I'm going to quickly ask you a, a quiz question. I know you don't know the, necessarily know the answer to this, but Brazil captain Maria Graf has tried her hand at multiple different sports. How many sports do you think she has played, and how many, and and also which sport? Which sport do you think is the sport that she played first in her in her life? Well, I mean, rugby league is is such a. You know, to be a rugby league player, you need such a wide range of skills. You, you need um, strength, you need stamina, you need skill, um, you need brains. So I could imagine her playing lots of different sports. Um, 
And the fact you've asked me this question means she didn't start rugby league first. No, 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 definitely not. No. I'll I'll say I don't I don't know. I'll say four. Oh, so close. Um, she's she's played football, obviously, being from Brazil. She's played yeah. she's played rugby union, and she's also played. Oh well, I say played. You don't really play judo. You kind of just fight. Um, she was a Brazilian under eighteen champion in judo, um, and that and that's a, apparently few of them have in Brazil, this Brazil team know judo, and they'll they'll bring a lot of that into their ta- tackle technique. So they're not going to be yeah. necessarily a, a non physical side. You think of Brazil, and you think uh, so apparently she also played volleyball as well. She mentioned it in the thing as well. So uh, yeah, so you were right four. Yeah, so this is her fourth sport. So yeah, you you were bang on. So just really interesting to hear all the different individual stories and the thing that I that grabbed my attention most on Friday wasn't the fact that the Brazil were there necessarily it was obviously autumn time now and the leaves are on the floor and everything else but half the Brazilian women were in the in the pile of leaves throwing them at each other so that, like they'd never seen them before and taking videos of squirrels and stuff so they're just really excited to be here and I'm excited to see them play and make history just like the Jamaicans and, and the Greeks have done in, in the men's tournament so I, I can't wait that's great that's exactly what the World Cup's all about and it's great that we have the ability to give those players like a once in a lifetime experience and opportunity yeah definitely um, moving on to the, the other team that are going to shock a few teams and they reached the semi-finals in the previous World Cup as well after after beating PNG is Canada and I spoke with um, their coach Mike Castle and this is what he had to say about the unknown quantities that are in their group it is a tricky one they um, we obviously know a little bit about England and, and PNG and Brazil is obviously uh, a, a bit of an unknown but they, they're the uh, I guess in the same boat that we were at the last World Cup when and nobody knew knew us and, and we were able to, uh, to get a win so you definitely couldn't can't disregard what they can bring to the tournament um, I think we need to, you know, prepare for every game the same, you know, the same focus, focus on ourselves and um, and our own improvement. But um, yeah, it's uh, PNG is going to be, a, you know, it's a, it's a tough challenge to start with. But we um, you know, we think um, we'll have some confidence from our last, the last time we played that we, we, you know, we got the players and the ability to to uh, compete with them and, and possibly beat them. So we'll, we'll be doing our best there. England are going to be um, one of our biggest challenges as well. And obviously they're going to be up for it being the home nation. So we're really excited for that opportunity to play hopefully what will be a, a big crowd and will be a really exciting experience for the, for the players. And then, yeah, and I'm sure Brazil will um, improve week on week and, and game on game. And, and I, know, I know they've got some phenomenal athletes from other sports. And um, yeah, excited to, to see how they progress. So, Robin, what do, what do you have to make of Mike Castle's comments there and his sort of... He, even being a North American side, they've not necessarily been able to look at Brazil, who are, who are their closest rivals in, in the tournament. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, they were pretty well prepared for, um, pretty well prepared for PNG in England, um, which is like like we would have, would have assumed. The fact that they don't know much about Brazil is not really a surprise, but... Um, Potentially, there's a, there is a chance for an upset there. I mean, he, he spoke about being consistent, um, and he was confident about PNG. But but their last game is Brazil, and like we were saying before, if you if you play the tough teams early on in the group stages and you've got a chance to improve, we could, Brazil will be better in round three, provided they don't have injuries and things. Mm. But then they will be in round one, and, and Canada's got them in round three. So they've really got to be careful to not drop off or you know rest people or have their eyes on the next round of the competition and um, take this Brazilian side seriously. They, they, don't, they don't know much about them. They're going to have got better in the weeks that they've seen them. So that'll be, that'll be an interesting game to, to watch. Yeah, definitely. And for Canada as well, their player to watch is Laura Marie, who is a, probably a household name for a lot of any, any Kiwis listening. Um, the standoff is an icon of the New Zealand women's uh, rugby league scene, having represented the Kiwi Ferns in five World Cups. Um, but at the age of 41, she'll be lining up for the Ravens this year due to eligibility through her Canadian mother. Um, obviously, her experience will be absolutely vital for the North American side. Um, moving on to PNG, before we hear from their coach, former uh, Bradford Ball and Wakefield Trinity player Ben Jeffries, I just want to say that when speaking to the Papua New Guinean 
coaches and the and the players on Friday. It's yes, P, um, rugby league is a national sport in PNG, but women are seen as, as second to men in that country. They're very much seen as not that people don't really realize that they're going out and doing this and there isn't a lot of support back home and this is what ben jeffries had to say on on that matter i think the results if i'm being really honest that the results will turn heads and then when results happen um expectations come and then it's, that everything just flows off from there um but um, hopefully regardless of what happens on the field whether they win lose or draw it's how they how they carry themselves on the field, they do they compete and all that sort of thing. Um, as we know, Papua New Guineans, they love the physicality and that's what we're going to embrace basically that part. And yeah, that was, that was Ben Jeffries there, Robin, saying that for, for the girls to have to build something with a relationship with fans back home, they're going to have to necessarily put in good performances. And I, I want to, I, I don't want to sort of mull on it and sort of stay on this fact but it is quite disappointing to hear that from such a big rugby league loving nation yeah I, I kind of hope that you know the sport of rugby league it's a language that crosses all barriers and so hopefully there'll be people out there that had, will sort of look up and realise what, what a, um, a great game this women's rugby league is and also that women should be second class in society so hopefully um, they'll be able to see through that and they'll be able to see a team that um, plays with that, that PNG style the, um, the physicality the competitiveness and yes results do turn heads but I would I would put Jamaica forward and say you know they haven't they haven't got the win but what a moment that first try was for them you know that's definitely um, it's definitely doable without getting wins um, I still think they're on for a win so hopefully that'll pick some up but I'm excited. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing this team play. I mean, they're they're kind of um, the to me. I think they're the second best team in this um, pool. So hopefully, we're going to see them uh, take on either New Zealand or Australia later on, and that'll be a clash. So yeah, go. I'm 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 really. I'm, I hope, another thing. Hopefully, they're over here, and we can give them a proper English welcome. We all love the women's game here, and we can give them a, a great atmosphere and really cheer them on like they deserve to be. Yeah, 100%. I really hope that they can make a semi-final and maybe shock a team, and one of the other teams in the semi-final, whether it be Australia or New Zealand, and yeah. and, make, and even make a final. And it'd be absolutely massive because we've seen how well the men's team have played and how well loved the men's team are with, with the fans over here because of the style of rugby that they're playing. And we know that this PNG side are going to be physical and we, we need to pray that every single team can deal with it in order to make an absolute cracking fixture against them. Yeah. I was um, Last but not least, we, I spoke to Emily Rudge and Craig Richards of England at the launch. Mainly, I, I didn't necessarily speak about how they're preparing for the tournament because I'd asked every other team the same question and the same coaches. But what, what I focused on with them is sort of how the development of women's and girls rugby league in this country has made picking this team extremely hard. For, for Craig Richards and one of the things that makes it extremely hard is the fact that there is now an England Knights squad for women and there is an England Community Lions squad for women with a fixture um, coming in the early um, couple, first couple of weeks in December and this is what Emily Rudge had to say on having three and then also a development squad so four England squads playing at a very high level in the women's game in this country and, and in the UK as well I think it's absolutely huge for the sport. I think it's really exciting uh, to be part of that. I think, you know, the game's come such a long way from when I started and probably, um, you know, 10, 12 years back, the England team, it was maybe difficult to get an England team together. Um, the, you know, and now the fact that we've got sort of three um, teams competing at a high level and representing our country is incredible. And I think it really shows the growth of the game. Yeah, Robin, how exciting is it to see the development of, of the women's of, of the game in, in women's rugby league? Yeah, it really has like um, come on leaps and bounds. I mean, um, over a longer period, um, as as the, as she just explained, over the last decade, it's grown, and they from not being able to have an England team to now having a, a, such a great side that we've also got um, England Knights to back them up. 
Um, I just recently, in, in more in my experience, I think that the uh, women's super league's been fantastic. I think that it's really boosted the profile of the players over here, and it's getting to that that point where it's like providing really um, regular competitive games for players, which is, is really great for the international side because you know players are um, testing themselves week in week out. Um, and from a, a personal point of view, in just in the city of York, it's it's grown loads and. Um, we've just had a team renamed and um, they seem to be, um, well, they are more successful than the men's and they seem, they're seem starting to get like an equal kind of um, platform it, here. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see how the women's game's grown. I, I'm someone that's um, recently got into it and I'm hooked. I, I really enjoy it and um, hoping that England can do as proud in this World Cup. Yeah, and speaking of the York women's team, one of the key players to watch for England is, is Tara Jane Stanley, a goal kicking fullback. The reigning women of steel led York to a grand final victory. How important is she going to be for for Craig Richards' side? Yeah, she's she can do everything, can't she? Um, I'm really really excited to see how um, she matches up against these NRLW players. Obviously, later on in the competition, but um, she's going to be really important. I think. Um, I think just all round, there's so many great players, but I do think we've got um, quite quite a lot of youngsters in this team. So it will be a um, similar situation to Australia where we need um, players like Jodie Cunningham, um, who's got a bit more of that experience to sort of uh, lead these youngsters that, that haven't um, been in this position before, come up against these um, NRLW players before. Yeah, it's going to be a very exciting tournament. Get yourself down to as many games as possible. Um, the tournament kicks off tomorrow, 2 p.m. at Headingley, um, England versus Brazil, followed by PNG versus Canada. Get yourself down there. I know you're going, Robin. Let, yeah. Take some photos. Get to speak to people. Uh, try and get a feel of, of what the fans are feeling, if you can. And we'll we'll, we'll just we'll just enjoy it. We're just going to enjoy every single minute of every single tournament. And like I said, this isn't just a Women's World Cup special episode or bonus episode for you guys. It's a wheelchair um, sort of launch episode and bonus episode as well. In 2022, for the first time, the wheelchair competition will be part of the Rugby League World Cup main event. It's probably the most inclusive sport of all, in, including the physical and the learning disability rugby game, because you don't necessarily have to be a disabled person to compete in it. Um, and both men and women can play in the same team. This year, it's going to be contested by eight teams, with Australia and England opening the tournament. There's been three previous tournaments held in three different countries. Four teams competed in the first one back in Australia in 2008. The 2013 Wheelchair World Cup was held in Gillingham, and the last edition of the tournament was held in the south of France back in 2017. This is when they're all part of the Festival of World Cups, in which they competed alongside the universities, the police and the armed forces tournaments. But the fact that this is now centre stage as part of the Rugby League World Cup main event, that's huge for this for the sport of not just the wheelchair rugby league, but rugby league as a whole, isn't it, Robin? Yeah, I actually think that because it's a little bit different, um, I think compared to other wheelchair games, it actually keeps, oh, well, compared to other contact sports converted into wheelchair games, it keeps all the key parts. And so it can be enjoyed by regular fans. But I also think it, it allows um, an easier entry if you're a neutral because it's got that intrigue. Um, I think they're much better at explaining the rules because they assume that people don't quite understand. Um, so I think it's actually really great for the sport as a whole to, to sort of branch out into this new area um, in terms of like getting people involved in the sport. And then from, from the point of view of uh, what it actually does for players, you know, like these, um, like you're saying, you can have men and women you don't have to be disabled to play and so that means that it's easier to make sure that we've got enough people to to run the sport at the lower levels um and it's great that they're getting the exact same platform because the as we saw in the super league grand final between um halifax and leeds like these these players are elite they've got some serious skills and they put a lot of time and effort into um training and getting their body up into shape and things. So they absolutely deserve to be um, shouted about and, and pushed out there into the public sphere. And there's some really interesting characters as well. So 
um yeah I, I would recommend anybody to give it a go it's really really interesting um and it's just good fun it's just got a real feel good um factor about it yeah it has it's certainly it's it's you said you were mentioning characters, and one of those characters is going to be in the Wales team, the Jodie Boyd Ward. She plays for Leeds Rhinos in in the Super League, and she's she's in she's going to lead that Wales team from the front, and it's going to be. I know you said the fact that you can have men and women's players in, in the same team in the same game, disabled and um, non disabled people in in the same team. It's just going to be absolutely amazing. France have won the previous two World Cups and coming to this as probably the favourites, but. England had a really good win against them earlier in the year and it's going to be really interesting to see. Just a quick sort of overview on that England team. Wayne, Wayne Boardman has been named in the England squad. Okay. But this is, this is there's a little bit of news. There was a statement by the UK Anti-Doping Agency on Friday um, and, the England, and the RFL and the England Performance Unit confirmed the background to Wayne, Bo Wayne Boardman's inclusion in this England squad. On being informed of Wayne Boardman's adverse analytical finding following a drug test following the Summer International against Wales, he was provisionally suspended from all competitions. This was meant he was not considered for the home tests against France in uh, last November. Following the decision of the National Anti-Doping Panel in February 2022, the anti-doping rule violation charges were proved, but there but that there should be no period of ineligibility on the basis of the player having no fault or negligence. The player's suspicion was lift from the game was lifted. Given the importance to the RFL of the sport being clean, the RFL convened an England eligibility panel, which also ruled, having considered all the circumstances, that the player could be considered for selection with the English team. The original decision of no fault or negligence and no period of ineligibility has been replaced with a 13-month period of ineligibility. This expired in July 2022, and Wayne Boardman is therefore eligible to play rugby league. So... After the game against Wales earlier in 2021, um, he failed a drug test. Wasn't able to then play because he was banned. There was no fault or negligence with him. So because of that, he was instead of being banned from the game as a whole, he was just ineligible to play for England, which meant he couldn't play in games this year. That expired in July 2022, and he's therefore eligible to play rugby league in this World Cup. Um, so good for England, good for Wayne Boardman, but it was a very when I first read it, it was very very confusing. So yeah, yeah, it doesn't, of, yeah, it doesn't taste good, does it? I no. think we were just saying about how we want to boost the platform of the wheelchair game, but this kind of feels like something where because it's a bit of a lower profile. This has flown under the radar a little bit. Definitely. If this was to happen in in the men's competition, there it would have been there would have been a bigger storm, and it, and you know there would have been a, a bit more backlash. So, yeah, it's it's not it's not nice, but um, yeah. But I like I want to move on because I'm still I'm. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to I don't want to get no, bogged down. No, yeah, no, I agree, I agree. I just I just thought I'd bring it up to see, to see if what like so people were aware of of a situation having yeah. seen him named in the squad, but he wasn't necessarily playing a lot towards the end of the year and and everything else. So it'd be very very interesting to see. Just running through the eight teams that will play, you've got England, Australia, France, and Ireland in Group A, and in Group B you've got Scotland, Spain, the USA, and Wales. For those of you thinking, I thought Norway were going to be in this Rugby League World Cup. Unfortunately, they have been replaced by Ireland um, due to the wheelchair team being unable to play or carry out any meaningful matches in, in preparation for this um, Rugby League World Cup. So the RAL board understood the difficulties faced by all members during the pandemic. And back in February, it was decided that um, Ireland, they withdrew from the competition and Ireland would would step up and would join Group A alongside England, Australia and Spain, who they will play in the opening game on Thursday, the 3rd of November, so this week as well. So that starts this that starts this week as well. And I'm, I'm just really excited, the fact that we're going to have three Rugby League World Cups playing at the same time, um, that starting. Well, we've had four, because the PDRL one has was, was starting. And I'm just going to open it up on BBC Sport, and I'm sorry if the sound's going to come on. I'm going to mute the site. It, the, the headline reads England heading for glory and it's England 28 New yes. Zealand 8 after 35 minutes 
So there's, I believe there's only five minutes of this game remaining, and it's twenty eight ten. And come on, England, that's one out of four. That's one of four. Come on. Well, when we were at the, I went to the game in Warrington, um, the PNG Cook Islands game. Yeah. And at half time, the, the a lot of the PDRL teams were there. I know Wales were there, New Zealand was there, Australia was there. It might have been that group actually. There's all, they, I, think um, all, I think all four of them. There's only four four teams. I believe it might have been four. all four. Yeah. yeah. So it was. It was all four were there, and they did a lap of the ground, and the applause that they got was like, it, I, it was, I, I, they had me on my feet because just the roar of the crowd behind these guys, um, I think it's great. I think that it's come on leaps and bounds, and I think we've got to thank. Um, Adam Hills for that. I 100%. Think he's really boosted the, the, the profile of it. And um, yeah, it's it's just really good. And what, what a result for England if we can um, bag, a, bag a win and you know, defeat all these rivals. We're, we're flying the flag for the PDRL um, cause. Yeah, it's, I it's, love it. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. So. Nine, nine aside, uh, a minimum of seven players on the field at all time, with, obviously with injuries and simbinnings and, and everything else like that. Uh, I'm just trying to see how long. Yeah, two 25-minute halves. So there's still there's still 30 minutes of this game to go, but England 28-10 ahead and really looking forward to seeing that. And I, and I was about to say, Adam Hills, as well as playing in this World Cup, he has been an absolute wonderful ambassador for all of the tournaments. And that we're going to get to a stage where we're going to get the learning disability rugby league potentially at the same time and it's going to be it's going to just really be phenomenal to see loads of tournaments i'm just really excited and i'm really glad that there's there's just there's everything happening going on yeah it feels really good doesn't it i think there's as rugby league fans um it's so easy to to watch all these different versions they're all tweaked slightly to to suit the needs of each um like you know each requirements you know whether it's indoors and wheelchairs five aside whether you've got the nine aside pdrl with certain players wearing different colored shorts and things like that and you even think about like um touch rugby league and nine aside rugby league and it's like it doesn't matter which one it is it's still rugby league and, the, and it it's the best sport in the world for me and it's there's something about it that's just it's the ultimate contest and what i love is that all these different versions still manage to capture that you still you still feel like you're you're watching this contest yeah 100%. so to have them all on at the same time to give the same platform they're all on the bbc um i would encourage anyone to try and get to any of these games um i i've, I've booked as much as i can um you, people i'm here i'm seeing loads of negativity about crowd attendances and stuff but honestly the organizers have put on a good event it feels like a really good atmosphere it's like a festival feel to all of the things that i've been to and i think that that i hope that that carries on and continues for the other ones i mean i can imagine the wheelchair i've never been to a game but with it being indoors i can imagine the atmosphere there is pretty intense because i bet that just traps it in there you know you've got those like hard floors hard walls to bounce the sound off um you, you're much close to the players like that's going to be really intense yeah, it's, um, it's, absolutely, it's going to be really phenomenal. Just as while we were speaking there, England scored another try, and there's going to be a touch, there's going to be a touchline conversion, and oh, it's, it's, he tell you what, he's got the length, but there's there's no line on that. But the phenomenal effort, like I couldn't kick it that that well from a touchline, and it's England thirty two, New Zealand ten, and it was a it was a pick and go from the um from the from the ruck, which was really interesting to see. And I know, you mentioned the different coloured shorts there and stuff, and obviously when you're wearing an international jersey. It's like oh, I don't want necessarily. You don't want to necessarily wear different coloured shorts because it doesn't look right. So what they've done in this tournament is they've done different coloured socks. So everyone is wearing the shirt yeah. and the shorts that match, and then it's different coloured socks. So if, depending on what colour socks you wear, depending on how you can be tackled and how you play the ball and everything else. So absolutely fantastic. Neat. So, Go yeah. away and pulled up there. Oh uh, well, yeah, you can't. Well oh no, there's a couple out there. I won't mention names, but they had, some of them have got them down their ankles. But then again, they've got ten minutes of this game left, so some of them might have played all forty minutes. So they might be pretty yeah. tired. So yeah, no, there's, I mean, there's three in a tackle here. They're absolutely battering each other. So it, it's phenomenal. Um, before we end the the special, I just want to say a massive thank you to to Joey Manu, um, the New Zealand fullback. I met him 
uh, yesterday morning in York after I just had a brunch um, and me and Robin had had quite a heavy night in York the night before <laughs> and I was really hung over so um, I just want to thank him for spending the time to have a little chat and take a photo with me as well really nice um, Robin thank you very much for joining me this Sunday evening um, it's going to be Monday night when you guys listen to this which is why I said yesterday for the for the, for the the opening game of the Women's World Cup um, I, I'm just really looking forward to everything so and also for those that are, are listening tonight if it's out before the Wales game I'm Welsh tonight Wales are easy to win by more than 22 points I want to face Wales in a, in a semi-final in, no, sorry, in the quarter-final of the, of the Men's Rugby League World Cup. So, but no, it's been very, very interesting. Can't wait. P- PNG are my adopted team. I'm, <laughs> I've, I've accidentally booked tickets to every single PNG <laughs> men's and women's Oh, so you're, you're, yeah, you're at so, that game tomorrow, aren't you? Yeah, so I, I'm going to be cheering on PNG. I, I, love the, um, I love their style of play. But, yeah. <laughs> no. Don't tell Toby I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he'll hear it, I hope. Um but no, also, Robin, I just want to say thank you. The York City Knights ball is, is in my backdrop. Unfortunately, you guys can't see it. Um, hopefully next year when we, we come to do it, you'll be able to see that in, in the um, in the backdrop. But no, this has been our Women's Rugby League and Wheelchair Rugby League World Cup bonus episode for you all. Um, Robin, thank you very much for joining me. We've been The Biff and brought to you by Swinging Arms and Shoulder Charges. And we'll listen and we'll hear from you all on Thursday for our 25th episode of of the podcast so thank you very much for all those that listen don't forget to like share comment subscribe just whatever you want to do with the podcast do with it so long as you listen um as england score again in the 43rd minute and he's cheekily giving it to a teammate as after the try line there and oh the referee's not giving it he's giving it oh that's that's cruel what a horrible referee give him the ball <laughs> Oh, oh, hold on! He's given a penalty to England now. With the Kiwi bloke has barged off into him off the ball there. Oh, this is getting a bit feisty towards the end. But let, let's go and enjoy that, Robin. Let's go and I'll let you go and watch the Formula One. It's twenty-two minutes in. Sorry, um, and I'll, I'll see. I'll speak to you um, in a couple of days. Thank you very much for joining me, and I'll cool. see you all later. <laughs>